Hi and good afternoon everybody. Many thanks for joining us today. Today we are talking about concrete slab design using finite element analysis. My name is Andres Herbe. I'm the sales manager here at the Master Series. And as usual, I'm joined by my colleague, Patrick McGinley. Before I start my presentation, I would like to quickly uh, I would like to quickly share some practical information uh, about the go to webinar the control panel can be hidden with the red arrow button questions or messages can be sent uh, with the chat option be free to type in your questions at any time during the webinar we will answer them during the session but we will also review the questions at the end of the webinar as usual, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our channels and sent out uh, to your email address. Quickly about the, the agenda. At first, Patrick will uh, overview the common uh, FE modeling issues and some typical modeling mistakes and assumptions. And after that, I will show you how you can interactively design concrete slabs using the master frame and our FE slab design add-on. And as usual, we will finish uh, with the QA section. So let me hand over the presentation now to Patrick. And uh, he will uh, talk about the, uh, some uh, FE modeling questions and issues. OK, Patrick. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Patrick McGinley. Uh, I'm one of the technical advisors and structural engineers at, at Master Series. So today, I'll be going through a couple of very relevant and useful documents and publications in relation to FE modeling and analysis using computer software, specifically master series. Uh, the first being the Concrete Center publication titled How to Design Reinforced Concrete Slabs Using Finite Element Analysis, and that's from 2006. Uh, it'll lead me into the very comprehensive master series manuals on FE analysis, which is as up to date as a software. And then we'll finish with maybe a few cross reports where I can highlight some reports carried out on real life projects throughout the UK that are relevant to the topics I'm going over today. So the aim uh, of this presentation is rather than getting too technical, uh, I want to give an overview of some modeling principles from the publications to help you understand when dealing with FE analysis relating to concrete buildings. And hopefully this will give a basic understanding of these and then point you to a lot of resources that you can reference and do some further reading on. At Master Series, we do deal uh, with a lot of customer support and queries in relation to the FE analysis and concrete design modules. Our support team talks to customers every day, so we have a good feel for what users are experiencing and how, and how the software is being used. And I'm aware that there's different levels of knowledge present, and so hopefully this can provide as uh, easy to understand for the more junior engineers, but technical enough for the more experienced engineers. Um, as I say, I'm Patrick, a uh, senior structural engineer with around 15 years experience and, and 12 of those were working in different size consultancies from the very large to the very small. So I'm approaching a year of master series in the summer and before my knowledge of finite element analysis was always from the viewpoint of a consulting engineer like many of you uh, listening today. The in-house experts on the topic within master series come in the form of key developers and support staff that help write and develop the software whose experience and knowledge on the topic on the topic way, way exceeds mine, but hopefully my experience allows me to address topics that are of interest to you, uh, our viewers today, and I'll aim to keep the talking points relevant and hopefully speak in a language you understand. And that's not in reference to my accent, but maybe some of you will learn a thing or two. Uh, I know I would have benefited from this type of knowledge when I had started out. So uh, just to jump in to the Concrete Center publication, uh, this is a 16-page publication from 2006, which seeks to introduce FE methods, uh, explain how uh, concrete can be successfully modelled and how to interpret the results. So it's a great starting point for learn, learning about the master series, finite element and concrete slab modules, and it starts with some practical advantages and disadvantages of FE analysis. For example, uh, our advantages would be finite element uh, analysis allows for the analysis of complex geometry, with the incorporation of large openings, including deflections. Uh, it allows for the modeling unusual loading conditions, such as transfer slabs, 
and it can all be done on the computer where slight changes are simple and therefore fairly instantaneous. Uh, so some disadvantages, obviously, the, the setting up time for models, uh, not, not so much master series, but I have uh, found this true with other software, uh, sp sp specifically setting up uh, individual elements in some of them. Uh, it can be a steep learning curve in understanding the assumptions made by the software and FE modeling. Uh, sometimes it can be overused. Um, there's some technical issues, like it's hard to achieve the redistribution of bending moments uh, within FE modeling, and it can be diff difficult to check. Um, checkers should have a decent feel for how con concrete behaves. So uh, those disadvantages remind me of the famous saying in engineering that all models are wrong, but some are useful, which basically means that statistical models always fall short of the complexities of reality, but can still be useful nonetheless. And this publication then goes a little deeper into what FE analysis is, its history, advice, when it should be used, assumptions within the guide, and then it gets into initial sizing for FE models, for example, using your span to depth ratios, um, some uh, slab depths obtained from concrete center publications, or user experience, which suggests that, uh, that are, and these are likely to be very close to what the FE final design will give. And then we can get into a little bit about the uh, software within finite element analysis. So the guide recommends it's preferable to carry out analysis on a floor by floor basis, as large models can take a while to analyze the full stiffness matrix for the building. Um, this was written in 2006, bear in mind, so it might be less of an issue these days to generate a big model due to better processing powers, but it's uh, it's probably still recommended in a lot of cases anyway, um, especially whenever you get uh, plenty of load cases uh, or load combinations. And it's also good advice uh, whenever you're considering uh, the stiffness of concrete frame buildings uh, in relation to concrete construction sequencing and related load, load paths. So um, the chart here, uh, if we look at the linear analysis versus non-linear analysis, uh, the chart here is not from the publication, but it'll give a visual representation of the difference between the two analysis types. And where linear concrete analysis, analysis uh, that's an orange, assumes the material response is linearly proportional to the apply load, meaning that the stiffness of the material remains constant regardless of the load level. Uh, linear analysis is a, it's adequate for carrying out ultimate limit state or ELS design. And then we have non-linear in green uh, that considers the stiffness of the material changes with the applied load, i.e. as a concrete crack cracks, its behavior changes and load shift and we we'll have to uh, rerun the, the analysis. Um, that, that is, so that requires an iterative computation method to account for these factors. So it is second order analysis that accounts for the change in just that incremental stages until there's a convergence to a solution. Um, I, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, how Master Series uh, incorporates nonlinear analysis into its deflection checks. Um, it's, it's worth noting that even this more sophisticated method of analysis, i.e., or nonlinear, can only give estimations of deflections to within the range of minus 15 to plus 30 percent compared to reality. And this is due to the many factors and variables within their long term deflection analysis. So when selecting uh, a software package, it's important to understand what it is capable of calculating, and a list of features and their importance are, are given in Table 2, uh, all of which Master Series can do. Um, we're also given a recommended process of design using FE analysis for both linear and nonlinear analysis with commentary and another reference to your stress strain diagram for both there. Um, we can talk a little more about non-linear analysis, specifically the long-term deflection. Uh, and when we're carrying out deflection or serviceability checks, we have, many effect, we have many factors which do affect the deflection. And the best way I can represent this without getting too technical is through a couple of simple diagrams. So the first being the loading history for a slab from the publication in here. And the second being just a typical strength versus curing uh, time chart for different concretes over time. 
So if we take the two of them and overlay them, we can see how important it is to get all of our inputs and parameters right uh, that we take from the list here. Um, for those factors which can affect deflection and are incorporated into the master series module, all, all, all of these factors are. So as you can see, there's a huge potential for variation in those first few days um, when this lab is subject to some of its greatest loads and when the concrete is going through its phase of the greatest concrete strength gains. Um, I've shown uh, red and a green to represent potential upper and lower bounds of deflection at this stage. For example, the overlaid red lines represent unfavorable conditions such as red line number one, showing the slab getting struck slightly earlier than planned uh, with more load. And the red line number two representing a slow, slower concrete strength gain due to associated concrete properties and surrounding conditions. Um, and then I've shown the overlaid green lines representing favorable, favorable conditions such as uh, the green line number three, which represents the slab getting struck <clears throat> slightly later than planned with uh, less load. And the green line number four, representing uh, a favorable concrete strength gain rate due to associated concrete properties and uh, again, surrounding conditions. <clears throat> so once all of this data that affects deflections are obtained, we can go on to an independent analysis within our master series slab deflection and crack control module which is an <clears throat> iterative, iterative non-linear analysis that allows us to get a more accurate deflection than our linear analysis. Um, and I say that not being an expert on, on the topic, um, I'll refer to Martin's webinar here as well, but <clears throat> again, it's important to re reiterate that the Concrete Center publication states that even the most sophisticated analysis will only give an estimate in the range of 15 uh, minus 15 to, to 30 percent and you can get a, a bit of a better understanding as to why that is. Um, so Martin O'Gara who is our lead developer and director has done a full webinar uh, on this and I would recommend checking that out. Uh, the first half of the webinar uh, he talks in, uh, in detail about the about all the, the technical factors that go into the uh, into the design, and then the second half is a, is a demonstration of, of an uh, action. <clears throat> I will post all these links as well uh, whenever we post this to your or social media channels after. So uh, going on, we following the publication, we get into some concrete properties, uh, and the guy goes through some information on the complexities of concrete itself and how it's treated in our assumptions in the case of linear analysis i.e. concrete being a, an elastic isotropic material. So isotropic meaning its properties do not vary with direction uh, like plastic or metal, uh, but I've shown wood as an, as an example here uh, as it will be orthotropic meaning its properties vary in each direction. I, I use that example because uh, a concrete block would just, uh, it's harder to represent uh, the, the isotropic material than it is the orbit, orthotropic. Um, the meshing, we also get to understand how the meshing takes place and how its shape and size affects output times and results uh, with recommendations for starting point for mesh sizes to be not greater than the smaller of span over 10 or one meters and some basic guidance on where to use different mesh types. Um, we've got a good comparison here, three different mesh sizes, coarse, fine and medium meshes to serve as a generic comparison for getting a trade-off between time and accuracy in your in your analysis. And as you can see, the finer meshes produce higher peaks at point loads uh, and supports, but it did take longer. Uh, in this case, the one meter mesh was optimal as it provided similar results to the half a meter mesh that nearly took four times as longer to generate. And as I mentioned earlier about the load cases, uh, that's, that's an important factor as well whenever you're whenever you're uh, doing your analysis. So this is this is obviously not the full story. Uh, I can get a lot, into a little more detail on, on this, uh, specific to the FE analysis when we get into the, the actual master series manual. Uh, we can give some tips on producing a better mesh. So it's important supports are modeled correctly to ensure bending moments at the supports and bending and the flexions at the mid span are more realistic. Uh, for example, you can get 
up to ten percent more in your mid band deflection if the column and support stiffness are ignored. So master series also allows for stiff regions to be defined for more realistic outputs, which uh, we can also reference later. For loading, uh, sorry, I jumped quick there. So the principles of pattern loading is addressed referencing guidance from Eurocode 2, allowing for consideration of alternating loaded bays, something which can be catered for, again, with a master, master frame as well. There's also a section on validation of the, re the results, which gives advice for checking and then looking at their uh, ELS states, uh, considering the different analysis outputs, such as bending moment in both phases in each direction to determine reinforcement requirements and processes in going about carrying out punching tier checks. So figure 11 there also compares a bending moment diagram of a typical line element um, versus a coarse finite element bending moment diagram, highlighting how mistakes can be made if nodes are not correctly located. Uh, that's because the only places where the forces are accurately calculated are at the nodes in FE analysis and they interpolate it between them. So again, the accuracy of the model is directly related to the number of nodes and so requires considerate meshing and modeling. Um, so in reference to your ULS design, the guide covers a little bit on the interpolate, interpretation of your principal X and Y direction bending moments, highlighting the fact that consideration needs to be given to additional twisting moments introduced uh, into the concrete, which can be calculated based on the wood armor method, which takes into consideration twisting in the slab. Again, an option with the master series. Um, the wooden armor moments can be considered conservative for slabs with regular legs when principal X and Y direction moments are suffice. Uh, but twisting can be significant with more irregular grid layouts. Um, I've used an external limit here uh, as I think it better represents the skew of the plate uh, to help you understand those torsional MXY moments. There's a cross report later in the presentation with, with actually deals with us specific problem in real life. Uh, there's a little bit on the redistribution of moments in the FE model versus uh, reality and their guidance on punching shear recommends you should carry it out manually using their own spreadsheets but the punching shear checks and design can obviously be carried out within the master series concrete slab designer module. Um, so interpreting the results here in figure 13 we're giving practical advice here on dealing with peaks from the output, giving reference to British standards and Eurocode guidance for taking the minimum peaks and averaging it out over the columns and middle strips. The guide breaks down the differences between the Eurocode and British standard approaches, but uh, they're, they are fairly similar and, and, and quite easy to, easy to understand, but a little bit numerical, uh, so I won't get into the details here. Um, and you can do this with a master series again by using the show section, diagram section in the FE results output, um, manually specifying section lines. And uh, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize these outputs and they'll come out visually looking more like beam bending moments diagrams as opposed to the red regular contour maps where you associate finite element analysis with. <clears throat> so, we covered a, um, can can everybody hear me okay? Uh, I think the mic might have changed, let me see. We can hear you, Patrick. Okay, yep. <clears throat> so we covered, uh, serviceability limit state design earlier when talking about the nonlinear iterative analysis and what was involved in the deflection checks. And this part of the manual goes into more depth and highlights the factors and numbers of variables involved, including their unpredictabilities. Again, I can refer to the diagram that I, that I hashed together on this to help you understand. And deflections are important as they can be critical for cladding and associated brackets before and after installation. Uh, partitions and where appearance is important. And again, I'm going to refer you to the full webinar Martin has done on a topic where he gets a bit more technical and gives a good demonstration. Um, so we'll read through these sections alongside Martin's webinar and the concrete uh, manual 
should give you uh, a good bit of knowledge and understanding of the topic. And then finally, there is a decent summary of what areas to consider, uh, areas you should understand after reading the manual, and then a good synopsis there uh, for design when using FE analysis. <clears throat> so now I'm going to introduce you to the Master Series Manual. Uh, so having a decent foundational understanding of the Concrete Centre publication we just went through, it should allow for a good segue and a much easier read of the Master Series FE Analysis Manual. Uh, and if you want to read it from start to finish, it's about 20,000 words. So, But it's an excellent resource, which is written by very own Barry Miller. And at 20,000 words, it's more than double the, the length of an average publication. So it is it is very in-depth. Uh, Barry himself is a he's an instructor, e chartered engineer, uh, one of Master Series key technical support staff member with many years' experience within both Master Series and a practice setting. So he's got a very good understanding of FE analysis fundamentals in general, and specifically to Master Series software. He has also had great exposure on how the software is used on a day-to-day -day basis, supporting uh, users. So was able to write the manual with this in mind. So uh, it, it is a, a great resource. So. I won't be covering it too thoroughly, but I want to make sure everyone is aware of it because knowing it well enough and being able to use it as a reference when building your FE models will raise your knowledge and make your models uh, more efficient. So over time, the manual has also integrated some very good technical notes. Uh, for example, the FE meshing overview and best practice and the verification of results sections, which are the first and last chapters of the, of the manual. And on the topic of technical notes, I'll just remember that uh, remind everybody that uh, we do have a technical notes se uh, section, which is located within the website's client area, which gives important technical knowledge related things to, 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 to topics to all things uh, master series, and it's worth checking out because that's that stays up to date as well. So. Uh, the intro to the manual covers in some detail the basics of the FE module, and you'll probably recognize a lot of those uh, terms from the Concrete Center publication, and it gives a bit of a summary on how the different elements combine to form a mesh and how they're treated by the software and the analysis. So uh, FE meshing, uh, overview of best practice, we, we can get into some very practical steps on how to generate meshes within Master Series under under this, this section. Um, and this is one of the incorporated technical notes and gives around about 12 examples of single surfaces created within master series with different parameters and how the automatic mesh generation works in each case. And if we want to jump into those uh, examples specifically, we can get an understanding of how the mesh alg meshing algorithm works, such as the effect on node locations, uh, meshing close to boundaries, rules for openings, uh, interactions between surfaces here, and then tips for dealing with larger meshes. So that's all in the manual. Uh, uh, so it's worth checking out. And if you understand each, each of those, you can, you, you'd be a lot better versed to uh, build up your, your meshes. Um, following on from these tips for setting up a valid mesh with some practical steps on resolving common uh, FE mesh problems, um, which may arise and how to go about solving them. So some steps are outlined here, but the manual goes into more detail as to the reasons behind the recommendations. Um, but in summary, there are many options within master series you can do to improve your mesh generation. For example, uh, I'll not go through all of them, but changing the global mesh size. We've actually, Barry has done another blog post on that that you can check out. Um, so uh, this can include making your mesh larger as, as well as smaller. Um, and then we've got some options within the with the master series itself. So changing the local surface mesh options, default mesh size, uh, changing local and global mesh sizes, radius of influences, um, and just as I say, it's it's worth probably. I, I'll not go through all of them here now because it's it will sound like me just reading off um, from the manual, but I would. Uh, again, recommend checking that out for any problems with your meshes. So, 
I refer to these as a manual processes. So we've talked about the FE meshing overview and best practices uh, from chapters two right up to 14. We kind of get a step by step um, for building the FE model within the master series laid out. And it goes into detail on creating a mesh from start to finish. Uh, it's worth a read through at least once before you start getting a, a mesh set up in the program. And as I say, it's a little more in depth than your average manual and incorporates plenty of background information in each chapter. So we've got our creating our FE mesh surfaces where we're at now, we're down to our attached beams. Um, but we've got our FE surfaces, creating openings, edge restraints, loading, material thicknesses. Uh, I'll reference a technical note on this on the next slide. Attached beams, global meshing options, local, local mesh intensities, local surface mesh options. Uh, regenerating our FE mesh and then our analysis and results. So uh, I included that uh, GIF of just going through the manual there just to help you get an idea of the what size it is and what it what it contains. Uh, so you're not you're not so daunted by it if you do decide to open it up. Um, so I mentioned uh, previously there about the materials and thicknesses. Barr has done a technical note titled uh, The Limits of Applicability on FE Models in Terms of Span to Depth Ratio for Thick Structural Elements. Um, so it's common for the FE analysis module, module to be used incorrectly. And in many cases, it is assumed that 2D surfaces can be modeled as thick, thick 3D solids, when in reality, other methods should be used. For example, deep beam theory or strut and tie methods. Uh, this technical note gives some background and guidance on how thick a 2D element should be, and the theory used within the Master Series 2D FE surface analysis method, covering thick and thin plate theory with practical elements of thicknesses of different span to depth ratios. Uh, it gives steps to ensure that the FE model remains valid and is an accurate representation of the structure, and it helps users to understand when FE surfaces module is applicable to different structures and gives practical limits and touches on, on the different theories um, and design code requirements. Um, and then finally, our, our last uh, chapter in the FE analysis manual uh, is the based on the technical note titled the FE analysis and verifying results. So this gives steps for validating the results of a finite element model which includes reviewing the defective shape, support reactions, bending moments, shear forces, and or stresses. Um, these are, the, I suppose, similar principles for undertaking a validation, for example, on a steel frame building, but buyers detailed what to look out for in FE models. Uh, hand calculations are recommended as well, or at least secondary, easily verifiable checks to ensure there are no critical failures or gross errors. Uh, so there are some standard uh, span to depth ratios and uh, moment tables are or simple member checks, for example, for beams and columns that are available and the British standards. So um, it's it's worth knowing these, and uh, as, as, as you'll understand uh, when we go through some cross reports. And uh, for reviewing load paths, I mentioned earlier that care sometimes need to be taken as load paths generated in a full 3D model may not be exactly the same as those which are constructed in reality. Um, Low paths and stiffnesses may not be as clear cut as what a steel frame building might be, for example. And so understanding this is important and may require additional checks when you take into consideration uh, construction sequencing, for example. And as mentioned in the Concrete Center publication, these verifications may be in line with a secondary hand calc or splitting the model up in the upper bound and maybe lower bound ranges for the design of different elements within the model. So um, finally, we do have, we do also have a, a concrete slab design manual, um, and then that is broken up into the slab design, uh, which is typically our ULS design, and then our slab deflection and crack control for our SLS design. And this is just a, an example of the slab, or I've maybe got it back to front there, um, or maybe didn't get it on at all. Apologies, but. These are the different contents within each, and it's worth knowing uh, where they are. And as I say, this this goes into great detail here, um, and get, letting us know about the background and all the technical information required for knowing about the 
long-term reflections. Um, so I mentioned about the cross report and we've got some uh, industry examples from recent cross reports which are specific to software and modeling issues. Again, I'll be glossing over a few different examples as opposed to getting too engrossed in any single case studies. So these are specific examples from Cross UK. I think there's a couple of Australian uh, ones in there as well, but that stands for the Collaborative Reporting for Safer Structures UK, uh, who publish safety information based on the reports they receive and information in the public domain. Um, so uh, hopefully it'll get you thinking about maybe some different conditions or assumptions that might be made when working with FE software. And in this first example, it's uh, it's an unconservative design of a flat slab due to software modeling issues is the title. Um, this is to do with excessive cracking on a first floor masonry wall, which was being supported off a transfer slab. So th this is not the actual image. This is, I've just put this in uh, as representative. But this came about due to an incorrect assumption within a 3D model where a designer had modeled a masonry wall in as a as a like a soft or concrete shell element supported on a on a base slab or, or a transfer slab. So the intentions of the designer, I think, were probably to incorporate the wall load and associated takedown loads to allow for the uh, for the load takedowns in the 3D model, but uh, they didn't factor in the fact that the model would see the wall as a as an actual stiff element. So this meant that the wall took the properties assigned to it and ended up acting as a stiff beam with the transfer beam attached to the underside of it, which meant the deflection predictions were were uh, very wrong, uh, and the design of the transfer slab was significantly underestimated. Uh, the report gives some guidance on about how to deal with modeling brick walls within a model, uh, although personally, I, I, I would have always used line loads in that situation. Uh, the report also gives some takeaways for engineers, and as you can imagine, they are to carry out secondary simplified checks on the models, for example, hand calcs, uh, more training on understanding the software and FE analysis modules or models in general, and finally to make sure there are proper checks in place from uh, seniority. Uh, the report has inspired another report called Further Example Incorrect Finite Element Modeling, which goes into more detail on the topic as it turns out it's, uh, it's more common. So, We've got another example here, uh, the concern over modeling of a concrete frame building for construction stage. I've referred to this earlier in the report, and this is to do with the modeling of a concrete building of several floors with a transfer slab on the first floor supporting the loads from the floors above. So uh, I was a checking engineer that found this, and they had determined that the simple, uh, they determined simple load takedowns through hand calcs uh, at different differ generally or greatly from the, the 3D model um, calcs. So the 3D model took into account that the building was being all cast in situ at the same time, instead of considering the construction sequence where each floor cured at different rates. And you can see there uh, he had a transfer slab and on the on the ground or in the first floor. Um, but the, the construction sequence meant the global slipness of the building was potentially different from that in reality which was affecting the load pass, where the upper floors in the 3D model may have acted more uh, like a Verandil truss, supporting this transfer slab with hanging columns instead of the transfer slab doing the work. Um, so th this meant that the transfer slab was under-reinforced, uh, and luckily the mistake was caught at design stage before construction, so it was a case of a redesign. But the report goes on to a lack of published guidance on this issue which they refer to as temporary modeling. So it's worthwhile then in consideration to construction sequencing and stiffness and, uh, stiffnesses when building your 3D models. So I mentioned at the start about how the Concrete cent uh, Center publication uh, told us a good way of approaching the design of a building was to take a floor by floor. And in this case, that, that approach might have, might have actually helped. And finally, uh, a few other examples of cross reports that are worth checking out. So we've got our computer analysis of slab design twisting moments. So uh, I referred to this earlier in relation to including the wood and armor moments in the design. So they've uh, they've highlighted that the fact that it's it's often neglected. The wooden armor moments are often neglected in in some models. Uh, punch and shear and concrete slabs at perimeter columns. And 
uh, a further further examples of incorrect FE modeling. Uh, I touched on this, uh, and this is to do with the, the incorrect modeling of, of blockwork walls, and it goes into more detail on that. And then finally, uh, uh, columns missing due to 3 modeling. Some of you might have heard of this, where uh, a new eight-story residential concrete frame building was being constructed, and several columns were omitted from the ground and first floor level drawings. Now, this is more of a, uh, uh, possibly a, uh, a technician's, a joint CAD technician's mistake, but uh, it just just highlights the emphasis on checking uh, all your all the drawings. And uh, in the case of columns missing, it might have been so obvious that it's something you might not have checked, but uh, the building was actually constructed uh, a few floors up before they, they realized what had happened. So uh, finally, thanks for your time uh, in this. Uh, I hope that I've given you some good background information there and some decent references to help you to confidently build up FE models going forward. Uh, I, as I say, I'll link all the references when the video is posted onto our various channels. And I think I've shot over uh, my time there a bit. but. Um, uh, I'll, I'll pass you back to Andrew I say, and I can give you a, a demo of the of the product. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen quickly. Okay, I hope oh, you can hear me and see me. So thank you, Patrick. So let's go straight uh, in, the, in the master frame. So here we have a single concrete slab. Uh, it is possible to model the whole building uh, in, in, the master frame, uh, in the master frame. However, uh, the model becomes larger and complex and requires uh, significant calculation time, time to solve. So as it is mentioned in the, in the concrete uh, central tech note, it is preferable to do analysis and design on a floor by floor uh, basis. So we have um, an arrangement of walls, uh, openings, uh, some columns of some, uh, offset from the, uh, from the edges. Before we go uh, and do uh, the design of the slab, let's have a quick look uh, at the slab itself and the loading. Okay, so let's look at the slab. So, so this is a, a 250 mil thick, uh, C30, 240 concrete slab. And, and because uh, we want to design the slab, uh, we have to ensure, uh, ensure that uh, we use the, the codified material for the slab uh, instead of using the user-defined uh, material. And we have a minus 0.5 kilonewton per square meter full area loading, a full area uh, dead load, and we have minus uh, 2.5 kilonewton per square meter live load uh, between the uh, the grid three and grid eight, and we have slightly higher minus four kilonewton uh, live load. Uh, between grid one and grid three. And what I have also done, if you go to the, to the loads, FE surface alternate loading patterns. So what I have also done is uh, created alternate uh, loading patterns to get uh, maximum uh, sagging and hugging moments. So I have set these areas to be uh, the load group one. And this is the load group Two, and if you see, uh, if you see the two together, then we see and uh, they give us uh, a pattern, and this will allow us to use L1 and L2 in the load combinations to get the maximum and the minimum and the maximum and the minimum uh, moments. And I also created 
and the opposite uh, directions. Okay, so let's quickly analyze it. Space frame analysis, of course. I hope, yes, it's, it's, it's ready. So let's uh, quickly check the result to see, uh, to see if our model works as ex expected. So shell elements result, and just quickly checking the Y displacement. So this is the Y displacement. Of course, we have uh, several uh, uh, shell results. No, I'm just checking the uh, the displacement. So this is the the OS span, uh, the D plus live OS span deflections. This is the uh, the alternate span one, and we have the maximum here and here and here and here. This is the alternate uh, span two, and we have the maximum here, here, and here, and this is the opposite direction. So it's it's good. So let's go, let's go and uh, design the concrete slab. So under the design menu, we have a concrete slab design function. And the first thing uh, that uh, that we can uh, see is the basic uh, data and default dialog. On this dialog, we can set uh, the usual design parameter, uh, such as the, the reinforcement grades, covers, uh, orientations, and the dialog also allow, allows uh, allows to specify the default di uh, default bar diameters and spacing. So when we add uh, the new reinforcement object, uh, the, the the reinforcement object will be created with these defaults. So we have uh, defaults for basic rebars, big zones, strip zones, uh, and so on. Now I'm gonna accept the default. Okay, so before uh, I start the design, uh, just a few words about the, the philosophy of the design process. So in the slab design module, we have three main reinforcement. So we have the basic reinforcement, the basic reinforcement, uh, uh, which is to apply generally to an FE surface. The peak zone, the peak zone are intended to provide enhanced reinforcement in zones where peak bending moment occur, such as support points or at the location of high localized loading uh, to the slab. Big zones provide options to define reinforcement in two orthogonal directions in either the top of uh, top or bottom of, of, the, of, of the slab. Strip reinforcement, strip reinforcement are intended to provide enhanced reinforcement in strips where higher bending moments occur along lines, for example, between column strips in slabs. The strip strip bar provides options to define reinforcement in either the top or bottom of the slab, and also whether the reinforcement is oriented parallel or perpendicular to the strips length. Strips provide uh, options to define reinforcement in one direction only. However, strip is, is meant to be a local reinforcement, like a strip zone in a column strip, to provide uh, enhanced and sagging reinforcement, or in an area underneath a wall supported on the slab. So if we want to add more reinforcement in a bigger zone, then we should use additional basic rebars instead of adding a steep reinforcement uh, to a basic to a basic reinforcement. So when first uh, designing the reinforcement uh, for slab, the first step is to define the basic method of the reinforcement. The first one of the design check will give uh, us a good idea of where the basic reinforcement will be enough and where we need to apply some additional reinforcement, such as a peak or a strip reinforcement. Then we can assign the peak and strip regions uh, to the areas where we want to have uh, a refined uh, reinforcement design. Then we can go back to the basic reinforcement and review and refine the reinforcement, as now the peak and strip zones are not being included in the basic region. And as a last step, we have to review the peak and strip uh, zones as the changes in the basic reinforcement may affect the reinforcement in the peak and strip zones uh, if we 
uh, added the peak and the and the strip zones uh, as a additional reinforcement to the basic. Okay, so let's add a new basic reinforcement first by clicking on the plus button and then select the FE surface. So straight away we got some design based on the basic reinforcement, which is if you go down, it's tens at 200, uh, both on the bottom and the top. Uh, over the whole slab. So how is the reinforcement is performing? So not very well at the moment, not bad uh, at, the, at, the, at the bottom, but as we expected, not very well uh, at the top. To clearly see the failing zones of the slab, you can ask the program to do, draw, uh, the, draw the, the counter surface for the unit ratio. So this is the maximum unity ratio of uh, the hugging moments in, in the either the plus or y direction. So we can see exactly where we need the additional top reinforcement. So the, the greens and the blue areas represent those zones where the basic uh, reinforcement works. And the orange and the red represents those uh, areas where we need to uh, add some additional reinforcement. And this is the maximum uh, unit ratio for the sucking moments in the either the, uh, in the, either, uh, the, plus, uh, the, the X or the Y direction. You can see the basic reinforcement on the bottom is failing on a big area of the slab. So let's start the design. Uh, let's start designing the, the bottom. Uh, still first. So let's try to increase the bottom rebar from 10 uh, to 12. So to do this, we need to go here to the, to the property area uh, and under the bottom bars, we can change the, the, the rebar diameter independently in the direction one and the direction two. And by clicking on the, the, the refresh graphic button, you can see clearly clearly the the result. So we can see that the majority of the the slab, the vast majority of the slab, uh, on, the, on the vast majority of the slab, the reinforcement is just doing fine. We have just a couple of areas over here where we have the higher life load, where the bottom reinforcement is failing. So rather than increasing the bottom reinforcement further over the whole slab. I'm going to apply a different amount of reinforcement in this area by creating a new basic reinforcement. So by clicking on the plus button, I'm going to add an addition, uh, a new basic uh, rebar set. And this time, I'm going to be, uh, I, I'm going to draw the, the region. So I'm not selecting the, the whole surface, but now I'm gonna draw the region. Just simply pick and draw the zone. Yeah, so now we have a new uh, additional, or we have a new uh, basic rebar sets here. So, and, and, and this, uh, and this basic rebar overrides uh, all the other basic rebars in this area. And, and I'm not, and I'm not gonna use, uh, uh, use this uh, to provide the top bars. The top bars are still uh, provided by our full surface basic reinforcement. So this uh, additional uh, basic rebar just, uh, uh, cover uh, the bottom uh, reinforcement. So no top bars, only bottom bars. Top, uh, top uh, bars uh, still uh, remain in the basic rebar one, the whole surface uh, area. So the bottom bars, so let's go uh, to the bottom bars and change bar diameter to 12 in both direction. 
of course it's still failing however now uh, we can uh, decrease the distance between the bars in this small area so let's say let's see the direction one first let's go to 150 so you can see now it's it's okay if you go to the to the to the, to the unity sagging xx then you can see that we we can see uh red any red or orange areas here however the other direction the other direction we have still uh, small uh, areas where the, the the slab of the reinforcement is failing so just to keep it simple i will also increase the, the reinforcement uh, i will uh, decrease the the spacing uh, to 150 over here in the other direction so if we click on update then we can see we don't have any issues uh, in this area now and not just here but uh, the other part is also uh, looks good so if you go if you switch back to the to the rebar one then you can see that the bottom reinforcement uh, per, uh bottom reinforcements work we have only issues just with the uh, the top reinforcement so let's move to the top reinforcement and see what we can see with the unity ratio so if we go back to the to the hugging moments then we can see we have a we have several uh, red and orange areas so the the uh, the slab is failing uh, around the, the column heads but instead of adding big patches of additional reinforcement i'm going to increase the top rebars from 12 to uh, from 10 to 12 again to make the failing zone smaller so and and to match with the with the bottom rebars so now uh, as I'm standing on the basic rebar one, I go down to the bottom, uh, to the top bars, and I'm going to change the diameter from 10 to 12 in both directions. And refresh. So now you can see uh, relatively small, smaller uh, failing zones. So now we have a basic top reinforcement, which works fine on the majority of the slab. Now we can start applying some peak reinforcement. So let's move over to the peak reinforcement. And by clicking on the Add button, you can add a new uh, peak zone. The first thing to say is that uh, is, uh, this is an additional uh, to the basic rebar. So it will be uh, the, the 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 rebar will be added uh, to, the, to the basic rebar. We have an options to replace the basic rebar if you want, but now uh, I'm going to use this uh, just as an additional uh, reinforcement to the basic. And I'm going to use one zone of reinforcement over this whole bit to keep it simple. But again, we have an options uh, to use two zones. And with this, we can have a slightly heavier reinforcement in the middle half. And uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so by a simple, uh, with a simple click, I can place uh, the, the peak uh, reinforcement, uh, just uh, the column head. We can uh, visually see that the, uh, that the basic <clears throat> size of the peak zone is not enough. So in top view, I'm gonna pick this handler and I will drag it to cover the whole area, both side. And because I'm using a symmetrical shape, so that's why the program automatically applied the same uh, uh, distance both sides. But of course, we have other options as well. So we have asymmetrical options and we have square options. I'm, I'm a symmetrical option is my default setting. Or if you want, you can simply over type and just type in uh, the dimensions that you want. So uh, the size of the, uh, the, the, the peak reinforcement looks good. So now we can uh, design the reinforcement. 
So we can design the reinforcement right there by selecting the bars. Uh, selecting, uh, se uh, selecting the bars ourselves, or we can do an auto design. So now let's do an auto design uh, on the selected peak reinforcement. So in the auto design menu, so you can say auto design selected one. Okay. And now you can see uh, it works now. And if you go to the to the bars, then we can see that we've got tens at 100, both directions. So this is a additional reinforcement uh, to the top basic reinforcement. Okay, let's quickly copy this big uh, zone over to other uh, internal column heads. And as you can see, the program automatically do the design, and you can clearly see that uh, all work fine. So these are the uh, the, the the peak zones uh, uh, under the the higher uh, live load. I'm gonna create a new one for this uh, smaller one. So I click on the plus button, and I uh, simply Selecting this one, just, just simply adjust the size of it to cover the the failing zone. And okay, oh yes, what I forget mentioned previously. Let's go back here. So there is an options here under the design force. There is an options uh, to select uh, the, the design force uh, averaging method. So currently the the strip uh, force is averaged over the full width of the of the of the of the peak zone. However, as you can see in the detailed design, there is a uh, few warnings that uh, the strip average width may be too large. Uh, so we have a couple of options here. Uh, under the design for subraging, so we can we can select uh, we can uh, limit the width of it, or we can say okay it's half of the width, uh, it's uh, uh, of the of the averaging, or we can limit uh, affected depths uh, multiple. So I'm gonna use this, and as you can see, it's uh, it's it's failing now because uh, the because of the of the uh, smaller. Uh, averaging uh, width. So let's quickly auto design it again. And now you see we have 12 at 200. So let's apply the same to all the other peaks I already placed. So using the holding the control button, I can select multiple uh, strips on the, and peak zones. And I can just simply uh, define them in one go. So it was 200. Yes, 12 at 200. Okay, all good. So let's go back to the smaller one. And as we also have this uh, this node, I'm going to change my Design force averaging method to the limit affected as multiple option, and now you can see uh, it's 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 failing again. So let's click on auto design, and you see we have 10 at 100 the direction one, which is the x direction, and 12 at 200 in the in the di in the direction two, which is the, uh, the the local y direction. And now I just copy this to here. Here, oops, it's filling here. So let's auto design it. Yes, it's 12 at 200 and 10 and 100. So let's go back just to keep the design simple. Or I just quickly delete it, it's easier. And copy again.
Okay. It's failing, so to design it. So it says it's 12 at 210 and 100. 12 and 210 and 100. Okay, so it should be different. So let's use the, the 12 at 200 here. And copy this one over here. Or you can use this big zone. Hopefully it will be okay. No, it's not okay. So we need the 10 at 100, the 10 and 100 both direction. So let's see, it works here as well. No, it doesn't work. Okay, so it's good. Let's copy those here. So now we are uh, ready with the with the inner columns. Let's add quickly another one to here. Let's auto size it and let's copy this one to here as well. And let's copy the same to the other side of the building. Hopefully it should be okay. That's good. And let's create a new one for here. Copy here, here, here. need to adjust the size of it slightly. We need to redesign it. Okay, and let's see. It's the same here. And here. Okay, and we have only, yes, we have the other side as well. I believe it works, yes, works here. So now we have only just the corners. So let's add a new new one to the corner itself. Now to design it, so 16 and 210 and 100 works. So let's copy here, here. However, it, it doesn't work here. It works here, so we need the 10 and 200, 12 and 200. Let's see what was the other side. Okay, and I'm gonna use the same here as well. And let's copy this one to here. Okay, and we have only just one last point, which is not covered. So I'm gonna copy, or I'm gonna place a new one here and let's auto design it. So 100 and 200 in direction two is okay. In the, in the direction one, which is the X direction, no uh, no additional reinforcement is needed. Okay, so now uh, we are ready uh, with our uh, main uh, slab reinforcement. So uh, if you click on the, the refreshment, then you can see that uh, we don't have any any issues. You can ask the program to scan for any failure options. Okay, uh, that is, okay.
okay, the, the basic reinforcement is still failing. However, uh, as you can see, uh, it just uh, just almost failing. So if it's if you go and check where is the uh, where is the the point? So this the front of them is here. So it must be just a very small area. So I, I can see any any issues here. So must be a singularity problem. And let's see the other one. It should be yes here. This is this is the other. No, no issues. So I I gonna I I gonna ignore them and I say it's okay. So the basic reinforcement in talk it's okay. So it's uh, it looks good. But other than that, uh, it's okay. Before we uh, uh, go to the punching shield, let's overview uh, the reinforcement we got. So if we switch to the rebars here in the drawing options, then we can see uh, the applied reinforcement. So let's see the bottom direction first. So this is the, the bottom reinforcement in the direction one, which is the, uh, the X direction now. So you can see uh, here in the uh, in, in this blue area, we have 12 at 200, and in the green area, we have 12 at uh, one, uh, 150. In the direction two, we have the same uh, reinforcement at the bottom. So let's see the, the top uh, directions. So this is the direction one. So you can see that the, uh, the, the CN area is the basic reinforcement. This is 12 at 200, and we have the, uh, the peak uh and we have the peak zones so we have the green the green area uh, green area where we have 20 at 200 uh additional to the basic and we have the the pink one uh 10 at 200 uh, and we have the side uh um, reinforcement 12 at 200 and then so on so this is the this is the direction one and this is uh the direction two If you want, uh, if you go back to the peak zone, then there is an option to show the uh, the peak zone dimension. So now you can see uh, the size uh, of the peak zones. Okay, uh, so now we are at the point where our main uh, slab uh, reinforcement uh, is our is, is adequate. What I what I haven't used is the strip strip reinforcement. Uh, if you go back to the uh, to the unit ratio, then you can see that the only place where I could use strip reinforcement is could be somewhere here uh, around the walls uh, to provide additional perpendicular top reinforcement to the wall. However, as you can see, the basic reinforcement just doing fine, but uh, if uh, 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 it was failing, then I could add uh, perpendicular uh, reinforcement uh, using uh, a strip uh, or uh, uh, strip uh, here near the wall. Okay, now, we, uh, now uh, we're going to do some punching shear design. The punching the shear uh, design is very uh, straightforward. Yes, I turn this off. Okay, and I turn off. I'm gonna turn off the final element machine as well. So as I mentioned, the 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 shear design is the punching shear design is very straightforward. We had the punching shear check. Uh, so we are uh, adding the the punching shear check by the with the the plus button, and then we we'll click on the point. Uh, point to which we want to apply that, and it automatically design uh, any punching shear reinforcement uh, uh, if required. As we can see in this position, the the slab uh, requires additional shear reinforcement. So here you can see the the proposed reinforcement. By default, the program uses the, the 12 uh, millimeter bars, and the and the bar 
uh, regiment uh, layout by default is is uh, is diagonally equally spaced on perimeter. However, we can use radial layout, even grid, or even uh, cruciform uh, option as well. If you check the design, then uh, uh, we can see that the, the design requires only five bars per parameter. However, because of the detailing rules, the detailing rules uh, requires eight, uh, 11, and 14 bars at each of these uh, uh, parameters. Let's let's change to a radial layout. It looks uh, slightly better. Okay, and that's another punching sheet as well. And in this case, I'm gonna add this uh, to the wall end. So the punching sheet design uh, can be added not just to a column head, but can be Add it to a wall ends or a wall corner as well. And in this case, as you can see, no additional reinforcement is uh, no, no additional shear reinforcement is required. So you can see that uh, the design and uh, the TT design uh, is ready. And it says uh, in the note that no punching shear reinforcement is required. Okay. So let's uh, add the punching shear check to all the, the remaining uh, options or positions. So using, I'm gonna use now uh, this uh, add multi-mode. And in, in this mode, I can window all the column heads and wall ends and wall corners. And I can add the punching shear checks to all these locations uh, in one go. So let's look at what we got. So as we can see, not every position uh, punching shear, uh, not, uh, not every position uh, punching shear reinforcement is required. Some, some does, but uh, not not every position. So yes, here I have a small openings, and if you click on it, then you can see that the program uh, properly. Uh, Take into account uh, these these openings uh, in, in in the in the punching shear calculation, so we can uh, the, we can calculate and design uh, um, small openings uh, just uh, near uh, a column. So at this stage, uh, our slab is uh, totally designed. So now we can uh, produce some output. Using the, the report generator, we can create engineering reports with all the graphics and details. Yes, so we can include basic rebars, strip rebars, peak rebars, punching shear. And we can uh, send the report uh, to a physical printer or save it uh, into a PDF file or a Word document. And you can also then export your sub and slab reinforcement to a DXF or a DVG file. So now we have only one surface, of course, and we want to add uh, all bars and directions. And by clicking on the export button, we can create uh, this drawing based on our uh, reinforcement uh, areas. So let's open the creative file quickly. Yes, I'll look at this loading. Okay. 
So here we are. We have all our reinforcement uh, exported uh, to this uh, cat rowing. So you can see uh, the color codes here and all the drawing is color coded and indicating the reinforcement in the, in the various uh, design zones. So we have, uh, we have a bottom reinforcement direct in the direction one, direction two, and we have the top reinforcement direction one and direction two with all the, uh, the zones and big zones, etc. Okay. In the end of the in the end of my uh, presentation, I would like to just quickly uh, speak about the service serviceability limit state design. So in the master series, I'm going to close this, close the the slab reinforcement design. So in the master series, uh, uh, we have two methods uh, to calculate uh, uh, serviceability or, or deflection in a in a concrete slab. The first method is the linear finite element analysis with uh, adjustment of elastic modulus. Uh, this method is only can be used to confirm that the deflection is not critical. This is a con conservative simplified method. If you're going back to the to the to the surface properties, then we and if you go to to the slab. material and thickness. Then here we have a material factor. So uh, with this material factor, we can modify uh, the, uh, the, both the, the Young modulus and the shear modulus uh, of, the, uh, of the slab in the service load cases. And with these uh, modifications, we can take into account cracking and creeping, and uh, we can modify the deflection of the FA surface to take into account uh, long-term deflections. The software includes uh, material factors for uh, for not reduced. This is the one, of course. So we have crack session, crack session uh, for short-term uh, with short-term creep, and we have crack session uh, with uh, long-term creep. Okay, so this is the uh, so this is the the first option. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a conservative method. And we have another option called concrete slab design, deflection and crack control. Uh, the 2021 version of the master series introduced uh, this uh, uh, new feature of the, of the FE slab design module to calculate long-term deflection, including uh, loading history, creep, uh, cracking, and shrinkage. Using the slab design module, we can calculate the deflection of our concrete slab, including the assessment of the time-dependent properties of the concrete itself to account for the, the variation in the material over time, along with an assessment of the variation in loading during the, the, the structure's serviceable life, particularly during the construction phase when the, the concrete is still occurring. The analysis therefore needs to be done uh, in time steps to match uh, significant uh, time dependent events such as uh, changes in the loading and the the slab uh, framework uh, formwork is struck the link to the to the recording of martin's webinar about the long term deflections and about uh, this uh, new feature uh, will be sent out in our uh, full app email so uh, this time uh, I'm not going to uh, show you uh, this uh, functionality. OK, so this is uh, the concrete slab design uh, using the FE slab design module of the master series. OK, so ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thanks everyone to attending today. I hope you enjoyed and learned in these presentations and see you on our next webinar. If you have any questions, you can get in touch with us on our usual channels. And if you want to try out the software, just go to the Master Series website, fill in the request form, and uh, select the building design suite product. 
uh, which uh, includes both the FE uh, analysis module and the FE slab design module. After the webinar, please do not forget to fill in the short one-minute survey to let us know how you like uh, the webinar. So ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you very much for attending and have a great day. Goodbye.